Okay. <clears throat> so here we have Neil Howe. Neil Howe. So he's this sort of revered uh, historian, so he calls himself. Demographer is what he also calls himself. I would say he's closer to a demographer. Not that, you know, uh, I'm, I guess demographers just study the history of demographics. Okay. Sounds kind of like an anthropologist or just a regular historian to me. But he, he, he knows his shit. Okay. I'll give him that. But I, I'm, I'm watching this interview on Wealthy on here which is a good, I would say a very good financial channel. That's about all I watch half the time is financial channels. Wealthy on it's a good middle of the road financial channel. And well, he's got a lot to say, doesn't he? So first he spends the first, you know, 10 minutes bragging about his accomplishments just look at him, though. He has that snarky, liberal, like, sort of neo-lib, shit-lib look to him. He really does. Um, I'm sure he's read at least half of those books up there behind him. He's definitely a boomer. Only a boomer would have so many books. Maybe he's a older Gen Xer. But um, he goes on about... The fourth turning and all that. And first of all, there's one thing that he's missing uh, in the whole conversation here. Now, perhaps the fourth turning sort of paradigm worked up until now, you know, between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, Civil War and World War II. Those were all about 80 minute incre increments. And there was He's talking about uh, there was a uh, civil war type thing in Britain. I forget what, what that was about. That uh, You know, there was the Seven Years War, actually, uh, between. So he was talking about in the late 1600s, there was some big upheaval in Britain. I'd have to look into that. I forgot. I don't, I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, there was also the Seven Years War, which was in between the event that he was talking about in the late 1600s and the American Revolution. So the Seven Years' War, which is what we call the French and Indian War, took place a few decades before, a couple decades before, maybe only one or maybe a decade or two before the Revolutionary War. Now, the Revolutionary War may have been a big deal to us but you know on, on a global scale it was not a big deal the seven years war however has been called the first world war that happened a couple years before um the revolutionary war so i don't know if that really holds up but the whole thing i always felt i mean it's a nice concept and it does it, it does hit on a certain sort of generational dynamic that occurs in human societies something akin to like a colony collapse disorder that you have successive generations the whole mantra uh hard times make good men good men make good times uh um good times make weak men weak men make hard times so that's the fourth turning in a nutshell and it does hit on a certain uh dynamic that does seem to occur or has seemed to occur, at least in recent history. But it oversimplifies things, too. But I'm sure that, you know, Neil Howe understands that. It's a good framework to go by, but I think this time's going to be different. So the first thing I wanted to comment on in this video uh, is that, that he, this interview that he put out, is um, the fourth turning is not going to go as previous site this cycle is not going to go as previous cycles have for a couple important reasons um one is life extension people are living typically to 70 or 80 years now uh that's going to affect the sort of transfer of resources and wealth and power from one generation to another and uh, previous to 
this cycle, the average lifespan was 60 or 60 years. And then probably the cycle before that was 50 years. But now, now the average lifespan is 80 years. So that's going to, at the very least, that's going to lengthen the cycle, maybe from, you know, an 80 year cycle. So World War II occurred. That was what he considers the last, uh, the turning of the last cycle. So 1950s to 2020, that's 70 years. So the turning is supposed to happen this decade, around this decade, early next decade. Maybe it'll be pushed back a decade or two. That wouldn't, you know, it seems unlikely, but I'm wondering how I think that maybe not even that it, that the cycle gets pushed back. But another thing that's happened is that the transfer in wealth and power that typically occurs from generation to generation in human societies simply has not taken place since the last turning. The boomers, the silence are almost all gone now. They're starting to go. The boomers still hold the lion's share of the assets the wealth, and the power. They never handed it off, uh, at least not in a sort of, not fully did they hand it off. The, the boomers today are still your partners in hedge funds. They're still, most of the politicians are boomers. Okay. In every, in every company, you're higher, uh, the people that are just on the edge of retirement, they're usually your senior people. They're all boomers or older Gen Xers. So what's happened here is that the boomers have done a lot of things that that I find not only atypical uh, in history, but actually abhorrent. And he, he spends a lot of time. What gets me about Neil Howe is he spent he must be a boomer because he spends a lot of time in this interview pumping up the boomers okay wait a minute now <clears throat> the boomers are largely responsible for the unsustainable financial situation this country is in right now the deficit spending i mean it starts in the 60s with the great society program kind of calms down i don't know i'd have to look at your at look at a chart but I would imagine it calmed down a little bit in the 70s, especially the 80s. But then it goes back up into full high gear in the 90s, early 2000s. That's the boomers. The boomers were solidly in control, especially in the 80s and 90s, okay? In, in early 2000s, too. Speaking of the early 2000s, the boomers certainly didn't have a problem perpetuating the military-industrial complex scam that has been ongoing in this country's history. In fact, they ramped it up. The military industrial complex has never been so powerful in this country. That's a boomer thing. Healthcare costs went out of control starting in the 80s. Especially in the 80s, you had a lot of increases in healthcare from what I just saw on the chart. Higher education, another scam perpetuated by the boomers. It's no wonder that the millennials have absolutely nothing. The, why? It's no wonder that they're nihilistic. The boomers have pillaged this country. And I can't think of an analog to this. I mean, normally in the past, each successive generation, like he says in this interview, there's progress. He, he goes on in this interview and he says, Oh, well, the one thing that's missing this time around is there's no progress. Without progress, you know, things he says, people start building moats and raising the drawbridges. The reason there's no progress, the reason progress has halted is because of the boomers. The boomers seem to have an absolute, absolutely no regard for leaving this world in a better place than they got it. They have absolutely pillaged our entire this country and really the world but he goes on pumping the boomers and ragging on the millennials you know i'm an i'm a very, i'm like right on the border of gen x and millennial but i would more identify as a millennial because i grew up you know with computers you know i learned to read on a computer a commodore 64 so that sounds pretty millennial
although I'm right on the edge of Gen X and Millennial. But he goes on ragging on Millennials about how they're this, how they're that. What about the boomers? Really, if we want to talk about, I can trace so many problems we're facing today, most of which I just laid out, to the boomers. You know, I really hope that um, they get to partake in some of the fun we're going to experience before they ride off into the sunset so they can so they can experience uh so they can reap some of what they have sown because they have sown a fucking mess they have salted the fucking earth and this snarky guy here look at him he looks like one of these snarky fucking neoliberal shit libs though doesn't he and the way he talks oh i'm so smart i'm a demographer well, I'm a historian also. I may not have a PhD, but I've read as much as most PhDs. I was actually reading a pretty good book today. This book I've been reading, it's an audio book. Um, it's on YouTube. Fucking awesome. As a side note, fucking awesome book. And why am I not on the internet all of a sudden? My internet just, just crapped out, didn't it? My internet just crapped out. So since I can't look up anything right now, I'll just finish my thoughts here so I can get the thoughts down on video. So that was the first thing is, to recap, he misses the uh, fact that life extension, that the increased lifespans might alter or change the dynamics of the cycle somehow. I think that's possible. Now, I'm not sure about lengthening the cycle because we are in a pretty unsustainable position right now. I was watching an interview by a guy named David Hunter the other day, and he seems and he seemed to know who he was talking about. He's more of a macro economist that does cycles and analyzes cycles. And he said, we're going to have another crash probably within the next year. Uh, and it's going to be a bad one. And then after that, the uh, government's going to turn on the spigots full speed ahead of liquidity, low interest rates, money printing. And then that's going to continue for some time. And then he thinks at some point, maybe five, 10 years from now, the uh, it could, everything's going to collapse. The fiat currency system will be at that point completely uh, destroyed. Okay. And then what are they going to do then? I, I can only take a few, I can take a guess, central bank, digital currency. It seems like they're kind of grooming Bitcoin to, to, to assume that role, but back to Neil house. So, you know, I, so, well, that's, that's relating to that. So, uh, maybe not lengthening the cycle, but certainly since the boomers never, handed off any of the power they've consolidated all the power all of the wealth all of the resources for themselves they have given the they have left the world much worse off they have they have perpetuated so many scams the healthcare scam the higher education student loan scam the student loan scam look what they did to the millennials with these student loans that was the fucking boomers okay the military industrial complex defense spending scam. How many millions of people had died in the Middle East in the last 20 years? Guess who that was? The boomers. And this guy, this snarky motherfucker. You know, I was watching a Real Vision thing the other uh, months ago, and he was on Real Vision. And he made this comment, and I knew automatically who he was in the tank for at that point. He said, well... The Republicans seem to have changed their tune on Russia. They used to always talk about how Russia was a threat. And now Russia is like their friend. Wait a minute. What about the Democrats? You see, he left that part out. Now, I'm not in the tank for either of these stupid parties. But you know right then and there, because he's, he, he's decide, he, he chose to go after the Republicans for changing their stance on Russia. But what about the Democrats? They went from... Obama saying, I'll call you after the election to the Russian ambassador to Russia's the most deed they've trying to take over the country by stealing our elections, which turned out to be a fucking hoax. You don't see any of these fucking liberals talking about that shit anymore. So anyway, I knew 
And by the way, I'm not a Republican. Don't mistake me for a Republican. I dare you to fucking call me a Republican. I'm a fucking libertarian. We are not Republicans. I fucking hate Republicans too. Okay. It's just that right now the Democrats are much more annoying. I mean, I mean, the Republicans, they got very annoying during the Bush years. Let's just be honest. I mean, they were extremely annoying. And with the evangelicals, that shit was annoying. A lot of these liberals are still traumatized from that shit. They think it's like the year 2000 and the evangelicals are coming in and trying to take uh, the theory of evolution out of out of schools, you know. But right now, the Democrats are much more annoying. And they're so arrogant. This is just a typical example. So arrogant, so snarky, and disingenuous. I mean, if you're going to say, oh, wow, it's amazing how the Republicans changed their stance on Russia and their attitude towards Russia, and then you're going to leave out the Democrats, well, that's a pretty conspicuous omission. So the fourth turning, you know, it's a good, it's like I said, I give, I give the, the theory credit, the thesis credit. Yeah, it's a little oversimplified. Like I said, he, he points to uh, the revolution. In this interview, he mentioned uh, some sort of upheaval or revolution in uh, Britain. I, I'm going to have to look into that because I don't know much about that. I don't pretend to know. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say I know shit about stuff I don't know. But um, he's talking about that. And then he says, wow, look, the Revolutionary War was, you know, almost exactly... 80 years later. Wait a minute. What about the Seven Years War, also known as the French and Indian War, which was a fucking ginormous war that involved, uh, which a lot of people, as I just said, call the First World War. He leaves that out. So it doesn't fit into his thesis. But, you know, you can argue, well, that's, you know, before America was formed. We're just talking about within America. Okay, the only you've only had two cycles so far then. I mean, it seems like a small sample size to create a thesis off of. Okay, so there's that. You know, something about this guy just rubs me the wrong way. But everybody seems to revere this guy. You know, he lives in D.C., of course. How couldn't he be a fucking shit lib? So, what was my other thought? I actually wrote my thoughts down here. I, I, I had a lot to say. Yeah, here I go saying, you know, boomers have created this system that has prevented progress, referring to his, his comment about, well, we have no progress right now. This older millennial, I call myself, went to the boomers' stupid oil war. True story. You know, deficit spending. Oh, yeah. And then he talks about the lack of leadership in this country, which is true. And what I what I'm saying, what I'm saying to people when I have discussions with people and they're 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 worried about, you know, the uh, United States descending into some sort of totalitarian dictatorship. I, I, I always tell them that's unlikely. Uh, we have no leadership in this country. Americans are. And I say that here somewhere. I don't know if I say that here, but it's it's really it's really a grating comment, a boorish comment, but it is a true comment. American America generally and Americans specifically, the vast majority of them are weak. They're weak. Uh, there's a lot of disingenuine disingenuousness going around. It's like lying has become sort of the go-to thing to do. Americans are weak. They're hypocrites. Oh, I'm going to go protest for social justice right now to make myself feel better because I've given my government my blessing to murder 2 million civilians so I can have cheap oil and the petrodollar. Okay, I'll call that shit out to everybody and they don't want to hear it. Americans don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear, and I'm an American, so let's see. Look, I'm part of the problem, right? But I'm, I'm looking. Let's let's say I'm looking at this from the bird's eye view. Americans are weak, pathetic, disingenuous hypocrites. Okay, and there is no. So that's, you know, I have no. I had no problem so much with what happened 
I have some problems with what happened last year, basically because the BLM people and the Antifa people are phonies. Okay, the Antifa people are not real anarchists. They're just kids. They don't know anything about anarchism. Uh, I doubt any of them actually read Kropotkin or anything like that. The BLM people are not only grifting off of social justice, but they're also grifting off of socialism. So the BLM people say they're social justice, but then really behind the scenes, they're supposed to be socialists. But they're not actually socialists. They're just work. I mean, it seems like they're working for the Democrat Party, but you're not a socialist if you go around buying mansions with all the donations you get. These people are all phonies. Now, Susan Rosenberg, one of the people behind BLM, who kind of manages the money, the funding. I don't know. I had they keep really they keep what she's up to very very mum, and she's really old by now. But back in the day, she was a real she was a serious Marxist. I doubt she is now though. So they're like double grifters in the Antif. So I, you know, the problem I have with like I don't have a problem protesting police i'm no friend of the police either but it wasn't about really police brutality it was about it was they were being funded by the democrats as we know they were being flown around the country by the democrats they were being bailed out of jail by the democrats the democrat uh sycophant media was working for them and with them so they're they're all they're phonies they're fakes Okay, I respect real anarchists, not fake anarchists. Even and, and I, there, it is. I think it is possible to be to have anarchism and communism at least on a small scale. You know, to have communes, uh, individual communes that are anarcho-communist, that's possible to do, and I have no problem with that. Where was I at though? So. But back to what I was saying, there is no leadership in this country. We saw that with what happened in Afghanistan. We see that with who our president is. There's no leadership on the other, other in the other stupid party. This country is bereft of leadership. Corruption is at all time highs. Okay. And then, you know, so yeah, he's right about that. The lack of leadership is a real problem, which is why... Back to what I was saying, there's no danger, in my opinion, of this country falling into a totalitarian dictatorship. That would require a strong leader, someone like Stalin or someone who I dare say during for his time was charismatic like Hitler. Someone like, um, let me think of another good dictator that was really um, like uh like, um, goddamn, now I draw a blank. Uh, the guy from Cuba, uh, Fidel Castro. He was charismatic. So was his boy Che Guevara. Okay. These were charismatic and tough people and brutal people. And that's what it takes to be a dictator. And we have nobody in this country. Americans are too weak, too corrupt. They're just. It's not going to happen. So we're more likely to fragment apart, which I'm fine with. And then finally, one further thing that he gets on is he has this. He seems to want to. Obviously, he loves government. And he loves government regulation. And he goes on like in a sort of roundabout sort of. Uh, in a double speak sort of way, he says, well, there's no regulation. He says there's no regulation right now. He said that. He said there's not enough regulation right now. So I'm not I'm assuming he meant government regulation. Wait a minute. Too, we have re, too much regulation is the problem we're having right now. Now I remember reading one of my favorite books. I've been rereading it, Democracy the God That Failed by Hans Hermann Hope. I I've been uh I had I was reading it. Like you can get the audiobook on YouTube. It's great. YouTube has a lot of good audiobooks, a lot of Thomas Sowell, stuff like that. So one of the points Hans Hermann Hope makes is that, or Hopa, however you say his name, makes is that when there are too many laws, when there's too much legislation, too much regulation, it actually 
it actually has the opposite effect in a society. It doesn't create more order. It actually creates more disorder. Because when you have too many regulations, not even the government could enforce them. So you end up in the government ends up enforcing them selectively, which is the situation we're in now. And then people lose respect for the rule of law, for the law, because they see that some people are getting they see no rhyme or reason, no logical rhyme or reason other than corruption over why these laws are being enforced so differently. And then the laws get so convoluted, the regulations get so burdensome and convoluted that people can't follow, the, follow them. And the rule of law breaks down and that creates disorder. So it is exactly too much regulation, too much government overreach because they can spend as much money as they want, because they can borrow as much as money as they want for now. So it's too much, and it's creating a breakdown in the rule of law. Because not only is the government losing legitimacy, but the laws are just too convoluted to follow. We're running into all sorts of problems because of regulations. There's too much regulation. This guy seems to convolute order, like this, the, the desire and the necessity for order in a society, for regulation. That's what he seems to do in this. You actually less regulation might be might create the most order. I mean, we had it. We had a pretty good thing going during the Gilded Age between the Civil War and let's say 1910, 1913. I think was where I would place the end of the Gilded Age when the Federal Reserve was created. Some people might put that a little sooner, but we had a pretty good thing going. Things went pretty smoothly. And then the regulation starts. And we progress towards disorder. We had a little few highs and lows, you know, since 1913. But so he seems to be all about he's obviously a statist and he's here like, well, we don't have enough regulation. There's too much disorder. So he's convoluting the two. Government regulations do not uh, necessarily uh, require, order does not necessarily come from government regulations. You can have too much government regulation. Uh, you you got to like go on, watch some of these China vlogs, um, Lao Wai, ADV China. And they talk a lot about how China has all these laws over there, the CCP. Uh, puts out all these laws and and they were over there and they were over there for years and you can see this in real time happening they have since had to leave since last year they were chased out because they did things like t took video footage of these huge ghost cities that the that were part of the real estate bubble over there that would you got to check that out but um In China, they have all sorts of laws. Dog meat is supposed to be legal in most parts of China. There's literally dog meat everywhere in the open. You know, they just had a law that you, the kids are only supposed to play three hours of online gaming a week. And that's on a, uh, you know, like at a certain time of the week, like on Friday and Saturday. You think anybody's going to follow that? Like they have all sorts of laws over there. Just look at some of these channels and they show you all of these laws. Nobody follows the laws because there's too many of them because the government can't enforce them. The local governments can't or don't want to enforce them because they're so corrupt. There's so much corruption over there. That's what government regu that's what too much regulation gets you. That's what big government gets you is corruption. This guy obviously thinks that government is the fucking answer to everything. He's one of these people. He lives in D.C. He's a snarky liberal academic. And I, I'm giving him a hard time. But, you know, people need to be given a hard time because these are bad ideas that are going to create bad outcomes. So hopefully he sticks to history and doesn't start turning to make hopefully none of these people in Washington they probably do you probably have fucking congressmen coming to him saying oh what would, what should we do and he's like well we need order and we need regulation oh more regulation that's great 
That's great. I love more regulation. Everybody in the government loves more regulation. I'm glad you told me. Then he goes over to Congress and is like, Neil Howe just said we need more regulation. Even some of the shit brain Republicans would probably listen. Most of them would listen to that. Oh, Neil Howe. Well, we should do what Neil Howe uh, suggests. More regulation. Regulations will solve everything, won't they? No, they don't. They make the situation worse. Especially when you're talking about national level regulations. The, the, the federal government cannot ma micromanage a country of 350 million people, okay, across 2,000 to 3,000 miles across with so many different ethnicities and cultures. The federal government cannot micromanage it. It's a recipe for disaster. And this, but this guy wants more regulation. So that's my take on him. I'm sure he knows a lot about history. He's probably read a lot of those books back there. Good for him. I prefer to read books on a computer or listen to audio books. Who the fuck wants to read a book anymore? You know? And just this, this, I can't get over just how much you talk. Well, boomers, we worked a lot and we did this and we did that. We lived on our own. Well, yes, that's true. Because the previous generation, the silence and the GI generation left. Well, the GI generation literally fought one of the, you know, fought the war to give you a better life. And and the GI generation created, helped create what happened, what the conditions in the fifties, they gave you guys opportunities. The boomers gave, have given the millennials jack shit. So all this pumping up of the boomers. I don't want to hear it. I'm literally sick of them, sick of them. This whole pandemic thing last year, this locking down the entire country, closing the economy down, that was mostly to satisfy the fucking pathetic boomers. They were afraid they were going to die. Oh, well, we got to lock the country down. But 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 what about fuck the economy? But but we're going to screw up the economy, man. No, screw it. I'm afraid to die. It was the fucking boomers. I'm out.